you end up becoming the CEO of a financial firm trading assets worth more than six billion? Are you curious about the future of cryptocurrencies and how data is shaping trading? Do you believe it's time to tweak financial regulation to achieve even more market transparency? If the answer to any of those questions is a yes, do not look further, you're in the right place. Flow Traders is a global leader in liquidity provision and also one of the major trading firms based right here in Amsterdam. Today, we are going to delve deep into who their CEO is, what they do, and the future of trading itself. Without further ado, please welcome to our stage, Mr. Mike Kunal. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, uh, good afternoon and welcome to Room for Discussion, Mr. Mr. Kunal. You're, I think it's fair to say that you're a globetrotter, having lived from Frankfurt to Chicago to Tokyo. What made you settle right here in Amsterdam? Oh, that's a, that's a very easy question. Uh, I was really seeking an environment where many different nationalities come together. At the same time, I was looking forward to feeling innovation. And I'm very much dedicated to innovation in financial markets ever since. And I felt specifically in, from a European perspective, a lot is happening here in Amsterdam. As you might know, uh, the biggest uh, market making firms, not just flow traders, but also IMC, Optiva, other sit here in Amsterdam, also felt that in terms of a very broad set of nationalities, there's also lots of intellect coming together and you're part of this. So I felt very excited about it and also felt it's a key ingredient of how to build a firm. Yeah. So finding the best talent, retaining the best talent and always driving in a very innovative agenda, if you will. So before we dive into flow traders, we'd like to explore your personal career a bit more. So like many members of today's audience, you studied business and finance, and now you're here sat on those couches as a CEO of flow traders. Could you give us a bit of a few highlights, basically, on the journey from possibly being in the audience to being sat here? Oh, yeah, indeed. And I think it's fair to say when I started my career, actually almost 25 years ago, financial markets came across to me as quite stable. And I felt, okay, there's either a choice to go left or right, but it's not much more complicated. So back then I felt I really wanted to get an understanding of how financial markets work. And I did join back then Goldman Sachs and really got into the investment banking arena, understanding how firms seek capital and how they build their strategic agendas. And then I felt markets with the financial crisis started changing quite drastically. And at that time I felt I needed a bit of an add-on component in my skill set, very much related to strategy. And that's after almost 10 years, I decided to leave then investment banking and join a strategy consultancy, Bain & Company, where we really looked deep into understanding what are the changes happening to us and the broader community, and at the same time, finding the right strategic response to them. Yeah? And I spent then nine years there before I then joined Flow Traders. Um, but in that time, I also started covering crypto globally and uh, the financial market infrastructure sector more, more broadly. And that really led them to an understanding how these changes can not just create challenges, but also significant opportunities. Yeah, and so you mentioned working in um, consulting for nearly a decade. What prompted this shift to trading? Say that again, please. What prompted your shift to trading ah. after working in consulting for nearly a decade? I, personally, I felt there's a, a significant opportunity coming to us. Um, and this is not just related to crypto, it's more how digital assets will affect, uh, has already affected, will further affect financial markets. And uh, to a very specific point, I felt that uh, liquidity has become a key ingredient of driving innovation in financial markets. And then it was not difficult for me to figure out that a market maker or liquidity provider sets as a very a pivotal stage in the in the financial market arena to really lean in and be highly strategic ab about the liquidity provisioning as such but also building the ties of providing the magic glue in order to foster innovation so that specific idea really started exciting me and still excites me today so now that we've gotten a kind of idea of your personal career i think it's a good time to move to the company you manage mm -hmm. Where would you say flow traders fits into the traditional picture with retail investors, investment banks like Goldman Sachs, 
uh, traditional banks like ING and large scale asset managers like BlackRock. Yeah, I think we are the perfect intermediary, if you will. So if you try to understand how financial markets work and uh, how prices are being you know, uh, generated in markets, it's all a function of liquidity. And as a market maker, we are providing liquidity across a variety of different asset classes and, uh, and globally at any given point in time. So if you want to buy or sell as a retail or institutional investor, uh, you can be certain that with the market making community behind it, there's always liquidity in the assets you would like to trade. So that's the, the point on reliability, resiliency, predictability. But there's a second point to that, which relates to uh, do you get the best price? And there is a clear correlation between liquidity and uh, fair pricing. And that's what very much flow traders, such as other market makers, stand for. We want to even down to our mission statement, make sure that markets are efficient and remain efficient even in times of turmoil. So as you might have seen in March 2020 when COVID struck, there was a significant derailing factor and markets became quite shaky in a way. And that's, that was a point in time when we did thrive the most. So we basically provided liquidity constantly and made sure that irrespective of all the uncertainties around us and the global community, there was an opportunity for market participants to trade. And I very much like that example because it really distills the, yeah. the mission we stand for day in, day out. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that there's a bunch of other trading firms like IMC and Observer. Is there a reason why these types of firms come and settle in Amsterdam as a city? I, I, I very much believe so. Yeah? And it's uh, probably fair to say that there's a very special uh, talent pool in Amsterdam, also a very special culture. The point I mentioned at the beginning on many different na nationalities also holds true for many different uh, uh, pockets of talent. And for us as a trading firm, we very much look for tech talent, for, for individuals with a deep uh, understanding of, uh, of quantitative topics and quantitative skills. So this all leads into you know, us realizing that this is a very fruitful place for us to, to grow our firm. And even we are excited about it to see what the market is offering us. Yeah. And what will be one unique characteristic of flow traders that sets it apart from the other market makers here in Amsterdam? Yeah, flow traders is the uh, leader globally, but also specifically in Europe on the ETP side. And so we haven't touched on ETPs yet, which stand for exchange traded products. And uh, a significant shift has happened over the last years and not just the last few years, over the last decade with the global community in financial markets pushing into passive investing. So what we stand for is uh, providing liquidity and pricing for exchange traded products and we have a market share of 30% plus in, in Europe. So that was the, the starting point of our company. We started then diversifying into other asset classes and also in pricing the underlyings, but the ETP component is the core of our firm, which makes us very unique. Yeah. And from a macroeconomic perspective, um, it's quite an exciting piece because if you look into the forecasts, global community is uh, expecting to see significant growth on the ETP side in terms of assets under management, which also intuitively makes a lot of sense because you want to find the most price effective and price efficient, cost efficient investment uh, instrument. And that's what ETP stand for, which makes us excited again as we are able to deliver into that innovation. Yeah. So for the audience members maybe not familiar with what an ETP is, could you give us an elevator pitch on what an ETP is and how it differs, for example, to other common securities like stocks or bonds? Yeah, an ETP is actually an instrument made out of underlying, so you have a basket. And what the difference is at the outset of it is you have, you know, in the asset management industry, active asset managers who are trying to seek uh, alpha or generate alpha by picking different financial assets at the same time trying to beat the market, or you replicate existing parts like an index in the market in order to provide a very cost-efficient uh, uh, efficient way of giving you as an investor an opportunity to build exposure in a very like easy way. And easy meaning there is uh, an existing basket as a reference basket uh, or uh, an index you want to replicate, and that's the most easy and most uh, uh, efficient way of replicating it. Clearly, and this brings me then down 
to our role in order to be able to trade it as both a retail and institutional investor, you need liquidity and at the same time you also want to make sure that you can rely upon the market participants providing that liquidity. Yeah. And what would be one drawback for investing in ETPs? Well, <laughs> there's always a discussion, is the passive investing the most uh, attractive tool or approach in, in terms of investing your money? Yeah, and some active investors would argue, you know, given their expertise and experience, they are able to beat the market. But then you see lots of research being written, uh, understanding that actually that's not true. And specifically from a price-adjusted return perspective, it seems as if the ETP investing approach is the most effective, efficient way in, in terms of investing. At the same time, I think it's also fair to reflect upon the fact that the global community has grown significantly. So you might have heard about the you know, upcoming approval of the Bitcoin ETF in the US. So that's another opportunity to really tap into another asset class in order to make it accessible for retail investors. So there I feel a significant innovation is happening and even accelerating, which very much benefits the end investor. And it's been nearly three decades since ETPs have been introdu introduced into the market, uh, during which they've grown significantly in both size and popularity. How would you say it's changed the trading landscape in your experience? I think one element is that um, there is now a significantly higher degree of uh, understanding of the benefits, so there's more retail demand, but at the same time the institutional side has reacted to it. So I also feel that from a product perspective there is uh, now a huge supermarket out there, which is great. So depending on your preferences in terms of risk and return you seek, you have an opportunity to find exactly what you need. I think that's great. Then the liquidity is a, is a key differentiator. So if you want to move your capital, depending on any changes in your appetite, that's doable, even on a global basis. I think that's, that's a significant opportunity. There's one element on risk return allocation, given the fact that more data is available. So the institutional side can also improve their uh, risk and return allocation significantly more sophisticated today than a decade ago. And I think there is a global understanding across the, the community what's needed in order to make that product efficient and even more efficient down the road. And this relates then to the rise of uh, retail platforms where you know the, the element of uh, having an easy way to interact and to trade, even as a retail uh, investor, has changed dramatically. So, and then there's a societal benefit at the end of it, because if you understand that a broader group of retail investors will gain more and more access to these investment opportunities, it will ultimately impact the way how individuals can build their wealth and their, um, their portfolio over time. So I'm quite excited about that because that acceleration will not stop over the next 10 years. So, Of course. And I think on that note, it's a good time to also introduce the ideas of digitalization and digital currencies, which uh, Flow Traders has been trading for more than half a decade now. Uh, what made you embrace the change as opposed to traditional banks which are slow to change? Yeah, I'm quite philosophical on this. Um, I've been part of traditional financial markets for my entire life, and I am not ignorant of all the benefits that were brought to us, but at the same time, I also see the existing challenges. And the challenges are on a very tangible level, if you want to trade specific asset classes from one country to another, one region to another, it comes with cost and, and time requirements. So if you trade out of stocks in Hong Kong into uh, equity in, in the US, that takes time and is not cost efficient. At the same time, there's a significant pool of assets that are not publicly traded, private equity, private real estate. So just imagine the opportunity to make that tradable through tokenization uh, would create significantly the size of the global asset pool. At the same time, dreaming about full interoperability of liquidity pools across all the asset classes offers an opportunity for an end investor to trade in and out in real time. So if you compare that to the settlement procedures we have today, they are borderline cumbersome. So you might have heard about T plus two, T plus three settlement cycles. So that's where liquidity is getting stuck in the system. And, uh, and then the last point, I did, made a refer did make a reference to data. I very much believe that data has become a key differentiator in financial markets. 
And you might have seen the move of London Stock Exchange acquiring Refinitiv, and at that time, global community being quite vocal about the, the relevance of data. If you really simplify it, then data is the key ingredient of finding the best asset return allocation for your portfolio, given your preferences. Yeah. So if you embrace global financial markets becoming fully digitized and tokenization, tokenization offering us an opportunity to also get more data and use more data for the risk return allocation, that could also improve the investment investing process significantly. And then the very last point is resilience and, and uh, I would say, predictability of markets. So the underlying blockchain technology, at its best, it's also an opportunity to make markets down the road significantly more resilient under the premise that regulation is part of it. And I think this is what has happened over the last few years and is still happening as we speak about it, that this innovation can only be driven with the high degree of transparency and involvement of the local regulators to make it yeah, predictable but also trustworthy. Yeah, exactly. On the point of trustworthiness, uh, we see a lot of financial pillars like BlackRock and Vanguard now is adopting uh, cryptocurrencies into their trading uh, mm -hmm. systems and stuff. But if these cryptocurrencies become less volatile as a result of this growing interest, does that affect your bottom line and your ability to trade on them? No, the, the volatility as such is, is not you know, helping or uh, putting, putting down the innovation per se. I think what we need to embrace is that out of the crypto evolution, you know, leading into digital assets evolution, it will impact financial markets as a whole. And there will be a phase of coexistence between the traditional side and the new side. And for us, that's quite appealing because we trade in both worlds. Yeah, we have a significant traditional finance arm. The crypto parts or digital assets arm has been built since the last seven years, and this is giving us now new insights. But it's fair to assume that at one point in the future, the new world will take over. And if you assume that then there is significantly a significantly high degree of predictability and a trustworthy setup, then it will also enable retail and institutional investors to make better predictions and to rely on the system as such. And I think that's the benefit for markets. So when you say the new world will take over, do you see a future where tokens and current digital currencies replace sort of uh, equities and fixed income assets? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> and uh, um, sometimes I feel that discussion is, is difficult to have because it really requires a mindset on bringing it back to the benefits it could deliver. And I think this is the, the, the point where it will remain and where it will need to be tested because clearly the traditional finance world brings a significant degree of benefits already. But the challenges I addressed earlier can be effectively addressed by the new system. But that requires trustworthy market participants and systems that do not fail and a regulatory landscape that is consistent across the globe. So that might need a few more years to be built, but I do believe that if those benefits are then being brought to the table, there will be a more positive sentiment and more big players also leaning in to bring that trust and bring that dedication to further innovating markets. Yeah. And there I feel there is a, a chance to make it a, a full-blown reality at a certain point yeah. in time. Picking up on that point, how do you believe that institutions like the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank adopting digital currencies will change the way that um, financial markets and public institutions interact? Yeah, they are a key player in it. And uh, if I just see how the world has changed when we did see the FTX fallout, as an example, where everything was quiet and there was clearly the narrative in the market. See, that was the proof point of the people who were skeptic well, skeptical that this is not the way how it should further evolve. But now, also with the, the central banks becoming more vocal on digital currencies and the global community understanding that innovation actually has happened and will further happen, these proof points are then being brought back to the table. And then you see big institutional counterparties such as BlackRock and Vanguard and others taking you know, a step forward in also giving their explanation why it matters for them and why they want to part of that innovation. 
And maybe that's the biggest change in financial markets. So when I started my career back then, I felt innovation was very much on a company by company level. So there was a great idea of a company, that company did lean in and deliver into it. Today, given the interconnectedness and the globalization we are seeing, which is a significant value for stability of financial markets, it's not sufficient that a single company steps in. So there you see the global alliances, and even to a level where regulators globally need to find their way of getting harmonized in their perspectives, right? And specifically in the US, the SEC has taken a very critical stance at crypto and, and digital assets as such. The question is if the Bitcoin ETF approval could change that sentiment, and I think there are some positive notes, yes, that could be the case, and then building it stage by stage, I think that could be the true revolution for markets. Yeah, that leads uh, very well to my next question, because as we can see, uh, well, more recently with Binance, or you mentioned with a uh, one of FTX, there's been a bit of a negative sentiment towards uh, cryptocurrencies especially. Do you believe that this possible push from institutions to adopt these type of digital assets will be credible enough to outweigh the negative sentiment from the public? I very much believe so, yeah. And uh, I do not want to now get into a deep dive on what FTX did well and... Uh, where they failed, but clearly what you need to do as a company operating in this environment is to be transparent and to ha have best-in-class operations and to make sure that uh, you're delivering into the expectations of market participants. So if I take it on a very individual level for us, we are publicly listed here in, in Amsterdam, we are fully regulated and we are transparent. And I personally feel that after the FTX fallout, a lot has happened around us where counterparties came to us seeking that transparency and the reputation we have built over the last two decades, actually, in order to be part of the next step. And I also like to have a transparent engagement with all the other counterparties and market participants so to understand what is the best way forward. So I also want to have naturally a critical stance of, you know, is the step we agree upon in terms of innovating markets the best most ideal, most optimal step forward, or do we need to dissect a bit more and digest as a community on how to bring it forward? And I also feel, as another conclusion, you can't change the world overnight. <laughs> yeah. So there is a point on building institutional appetite that leads then into retail appetite or vice versa. There's always a debate, where does innovation come from? But in my mind, it's clear that the institutional side needs to embrace it because that's actually how to build the underlying infrastructure you need. And then you need to deliver into it without any bad surprises and ideally being clear what the benefits are for the end investor again and, and using that as a platform in order to thrive. No? Yeah, well, you mentioned it before and I think a key um, determinant in what we're talking about today is data. How has the role of data changed in financial markets in the past 15 years, for example? Yeah, I feel that uh, data has been, let's say, not really democratized. So when we talk about data, it's not one data set. So the financial market data you need in order to drive the right financial investment decisions, historically it has been quite difficult and uh, costly to get the right data and to create a, a kind of repository where all the ingredients in terms of insights, data-driven insights you need are there. So if I lean into the tokenization of assets, I'm also leaning into democratization of data. Because ultimately, if you really believe in it, if all the data pieces you need to drive the best decisions are easily and fully available, your investment decisions will be significantly more enhanced and optimized. And then leaning into that, you can argue that this will further stabilize financial markets and make sure that there is a continued increase in both retail and institutional demand. So by just understanding that tokenization of asset means that a significantly bigger portion of data comes to financial markets, accessible for investors, could be a, a key game changer in markets. And as, as of that data democratizes and the markets change, uh, do you personally include more different forms like news coverage or social media sentiment into your financial models? This is constantly evolving. I think from a core trading standpoint, what has changed is that the emergence of algorithmic trading was quite dominant. So using data in order to improve your trading and to have predictive capabilities to 
make markets more resilient. I think that's a key ingredient, and many players, including ourselves, have reacted up on this. That's only effective if you have the right data, so I think that's the, a key piece. Um, but the, the trading styles we deploy are on an innov innovative curve by default. So we're trying to get as much information into the system in order to make sure that we drive the right trading decisions day yeah. in, day out. Yeah. And the way you take in this information, had, was it changed at any point, like say with the whole Reddit GameStop fiasco, was there any point where you had to like sit down and say, okay, we need to change the type of data we take in? I wouldn't say that this was specifically related to the data intake, but more related to what we call trader acumen. Yeah. So what we realized is uh, the data in itself is not the key decision factor. So we need to have an understanding, where do we stand from a macroeconomic environment? Where do we stand with uh, the changes we are anticipating that might be hard to be, uh, that might not be predictable just from the data set, but are driven from our experience and the insights and our understanding of the different markets we trade in. So it's more the kind of aggregated perspective of what are we truly seeing. And by the way, that's also a point where I see that we are able to quite uh, significantly differentiate ourselves from others. Because if you just base your trade decisions on data, as data comes in, I feel that's not giving you a competitive edge. Yeah. So you need lots of experience and uh, our traders actually get equipped and trained with always having a broad perspective on what they're trading upon, in which markets they operate, in order to drive the best decisions. So. And how do you ensure then that your traders are not solely focused on data, but also have this more global dimension? Now, there's a whole system behind it. So we have on the trading desk, you know, people who are doing macroeconomic research. We have uh, uh, quantitative uh, skills um, uh, on the trading desk. So there's a lot of different archetypes coming together in order to drive it. And then there's a tooling in order to make it scalable and fast, right? So majority of our kind of work is automated. Yeah, It has been automated uh, over, over many years in order to make it digestible and to really give us an opportunity to focus on what matters the most. You know? But that's a constant process where we are, yeah, in a way, uh, iterating day in, day out in order to improve the effectiveness of our trading. And I think it's also important to touch upon the more controversial side of data, more specifically uh, the concept of payments for orders flow. Yeah. For those in the crowd that aren't aware of the topic, it basically refers to a concept recently banned in the EU where market makers and trading firms pay uh, brokers for their clients' trading information. And on that, do you think the concept of it goes and is contradictory to your mission statement efficiency and transparency? Yeah, we have ever since been vocal about it that we are very critical regarding PFOF because with the point on making markets transparent and efficient and getting to the best price, I feel if you if you are dissecting data flows and if you make certain parts of the data proprietary, you're not leaning in for what's best for markets. And I know that this has been, for the last few years, a very controversial debate, but I also, from a, a firm perspective, even strategy perspective, I feel quite proud sitting here saying that we are not you know, leaning in for PFOF, we are not depending upon it, uh, dependent upon it, and as such, I very much feel that our stance is very consistent with our mission yeah. statement. Well, bearing in mind what we've talked about up to now, can we then conclude that the um, increased liquidity pool given by digital assets and the uh, larger access to data made markets more accessible? I feel it, make, it, it will make markets more accessible. I very much see that this innovation will not just impact the size of the asset pool, but also the opportunities arising on the front end, if you will. So the way retail investors will be able to transact and uh, steer into the most innovation, innovative products they can, they can buy and sell, that will be massively impacted. So I feel quite excited about it. At the, at the same time, just understanding that from an asset allocation perspective, and now specifically on a retail investor perspective, there is a chance that you know, the transaction cost will be significantly lowered even further, that you're able to you know, invest in opportunities that are hard for retail investors now to, to access such as private equity, right? It's, uh, it's very difficult to invest in private equity and there are some platforms 
such as Moonfair and others, where retail investors at a certain threshold can start investing. But if you make that really fully tradable, and more importantly, always create a moment of a fair pricing related to it and make it resilient, so predictable for you, you can go in and out whenever you want. That's a true opportunity. And last year, we uh, had a discussion in Davos about that evolution, and I even felt that uh, it's important to say that there's a societal benefit attached to it, because there is, as we sit here, a significant portion of uh, population across the world unbanked, right? Um, groups of, of, uh, of people who don't have access to financial investment opportunities. So if you push the idea of making it much more easy to, to access it and to, to trade, uh, and giving that technical opportunity uh, out to the world, there's a significant impact you can create, which uh, I think we all should be excited about. But uh, when you increase ac accessibility to these securities and digital assets that have like heavy theoretical and technological backgrounds, don't you think well-equipped firms like flow traders with data scientists and powerful computers end up winning in those situations because they have access to more just general technology and capital to back them up? I think you need to define what you mean by winning think uh, uh, market makers will benefit from it, yeah. um, but the winning lies in creating the benefits for the investors. Otherwise, our mission statement would go away. So and this is really the foundation of our business. So we need to be there for a reason. And the reason is to make you know, all the instruments being traded accessible and providing the best price at any point in time. So if the community is embracing that concept and it's creating highly resilient systems, on which we can trade and, and any investor can engage on, I think that's then the real, the, the best path forward. Would you say that then the existence of flow traders is absolutely beneficial for the retail investor? Oh, I definitely believe so. Yes, indeed. And to be honest, I mean, you can have a, a, a very long debate on how to build a successful firm. I very much come out in saying, if you have a very strong mission statement and a vision, everybody can relate to, not just the employees, but the broader stakeholder set, the investors, yeah, which in our case is creating liquidity or providing liquidity for uh, the most efficient variant of efficient markets, then I feel you have a, a multi-year strategy in place you can deliver into. And then with digital assets becoming a reality for financial markets, I, thi I think this becomes even more relevant. And I made a point a few minutes ago on why liquidity has become a strategic ingredient of driving innovation in markets because without liquidity, you're not able to attract the institutional and retail demand you seek. And specifically now, seeing that global financial markets are on the verge of tipping into a new form of markets, that becomes a key ingredient. So it's at the beginning and at the end of that innovation curve in our mind. Well, I think it's a very good time to look at our audience and see if there are any audience questions. Okay, uh, so we'll go right here. Somebody will come. Room. Somebody will Michael come with a microphone. Ranger. Yes, here we are. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I would like to ask uh, your opinion on some uh, cryptocurrency-related um, topics. So cryptocurrencies are um, um, not very well regulated. So there has been seen a lot of manipulation from some big market makers. Uh, not traders more like with China and uh, initially there was a lot of hype uh, into cryptocurrencies relative to the technology they have but there is, there is a lack of underlying value to the asset itself so there is a lot of skepticism around these topics and uh, I would like to ask your opinion on what is your thoughts on this and um, also would like to ask uh, since uh, the correlation with uh, equities seems to converge and they don't bring any additional value, how do you see them bringing more value as a diversification tool? Thank you. Yeah, that's not an easy question, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to do my best. Um, immediate reaction is there are two sides to it. So the first part is, uh, in my mind, the relevance of regulation and transparency. So I'm quite mindful of the speculation around cryptocurrencies and more importantly, I'm also reflective of what has happened in the public mind, right? Um, putting that into a bit of a grayish area and putting a question mark onto it. However, I do believe that at a certain point in time, we are not debating the 
speculative side of crypto per se, but talking about the benefits of the underlying technology. And at a certain point, I feel that the community will understand, even the global investor community understand, that the crypto evolution was needed in order to build the infrastructure to really lean into the delivery of digital assets. And then when we talk about digital assets, so tokenization of equity, of bonds, and then the illiquid assets we talked about, like private debt, for instance, or private equity, people will understand very strongly why that was needed and what the benefits are for the community. So that's one element. The second element I feel is transparency. Because right now it's very difficult to get a clear understanding what's really happening. Yeah? And uh, I feel the regulator or the, uh, the regulatory community as such will set uh, the foundation of explaining where we stand and how it will further evolve and uh, thereby also providing credibility and, um, and clarity about the innovation going forward. The last point I feel is when we talk about regulated markets, I also feel strongly about big institutional investors uh, coming across as dedicated to that new version of enabling trading and, uh, and investing. And BlackRock, Vanguard, others, hopefully more to come, will set the stage properly for the next few years and hopefully including ourselves um, playing our part in connecting the dots and making it quite clear what, uh, what we want to deliver going forward. So I think the speculation as such is quite detrimental to what we want to achieve more mid to long term. Okay, any other questions? Uh, we'll go to the person next to you. Um, yeah, hi, thanks for joining us today. Um, I have, I think my question is kind of related or a bit of a follow up more specific because I don't know, in the past couple of days, um, it's related obviously to crypto and Bitcoin. Jamie Dimon came out with a quite harsh statement. It was quite out in the news and kind of to build up on that. Um, I'm always interested to see because sometimes it's interesting. You can't really tell, are they against it or are they still, are they not, have they not joined right, the train right yet? Can mm -hmm. they not benefit yet from it, right? That's kind of the question because I think most of us can, re can relate that it's obviously beneficial for, well, a lot of people, there are a lot of issues as well. But do you think that those types of institutions, because you've also worked mm -hmm. for one, are also one of the key players, not just the, you know, the huge asset managers in those institutions, for instance, on the buy side, but, but like the traditional mm -hmm. huge institutions, um, aren't they also the ones that need to, because they work with the governments, they work with the regulators and yeah, the entire structure. I, I completely agree with you. And uh, as a matter of fact, we are spending a meaningful amount of time on engaging with uh, the big uh, investment banks in order to understand how they drive their crypto and digital assets agendas. And clearly for them being huge institutions coming from the traditional side, the starting point is, has been different and uh, the way they lean in also needs to be different. But what I sense, and that's a reflection of how it evolved over the last I would say one and a half, two years, there's significantly more openness and appetite to understand how they can play a role in it. And it's also fair to say, if you take Goldman as an institution, they have dedicated teams in place for digital assets already to seek and di dissect the various use cases available for them in order to understand how they can evolve their business. And I think it comes in twofold. One is understanding what might happen in the future that might impact the existing business model. But secondly, to your point, they also want to be part of it. They want to be part of it because they feel they can deliver the reputation and the credibility needed in order to make it a reality. And at the same time, they need to, or I think they are reflective enough to understand if they don't participate, there's also a risk of instability because all of a sudden you have conflicting financial systems and, uh, and innovation happening across not just the regulatory landscape, but innovation happening in terms of investment products that will naturally affect their clients as well. So they want to lean in, but I completely confirm your perspective. Without them, it would be very difficult. And I don't see it in a kind of, uh, I would say, um, binary way. Binary MA meaning without them it wouldn't work. I think they will naturally be part of it, but in order to make it uh, a global reality for the 
financial investment community as such, it's also important that we have a, a constant and open dialogue about the challenges. Because I do hear what Jamie Diamond and others are saying, and that relates then to the lack of transparency, the lack of resilience, the lack of, uh, I would say, best-in-class KYC, AML, all these bits and, bits and pieces need to be tackled and addressed. So in a way, I'm quite uh, appreciative for these comments, and it's important for us to, for us as a community to relate to them. Yeah. We'll have some more time for audience questions later. Um, uh, moving, yeah, so moving on from those lovely questions, uh, it's probably a good time to touch upon regulation, and more specifically, the EU's F enhancing efforts to try to add more transparency in the markets, more, speci more specifically, MIFID II. Mm -hmm. uh, for those that don't know, it was a recent EU legislation that encouraged financial institutions to be more trans transparent about their financial information. And our question was more, does that legislation help you or hinder you in your mission statement? It very much helps us. And I think anything around increased transparency and acknowledgement of the regulator that uh, you know, making the system more resilient and, uh, and creating a clear understanding of the different roles of the market participants is extremely helpful. I think uh, if I just put my mind back into the, I would say the months prior to the FTX fallout, where there was this gist of innovation needs to come out of the non-regulated side of the market, because there you can push the boundaries and that's what this type of innovation needs. It's quite interesting to see that nobody believes that anymore. So I had uh, discussions where I felt it was fair to say that from my standpoint, the regulator needs to be a co-architect in driving the innovation. And with Mika coming up uh, to regulate uh, crypto and digital assets as such, that's another milestone for market participants to have a better understanding on the environment in which they operate. And there's one specific point I'd like to highlight. What we talk about requires significant investments, right? If you just see the last three, four decades of investments in traditional financial markets, billions have been invested across the global community. Any, any change requires a lot of capital behind it. Exactly. And, and then you ask yourself, okay, where's this capital coming from? It's coming from existing market participants, buy side, sell side. It's coming from private equity, from venture capital. So in order to make that capital effective, and I think there's not a lack of capital on this planet, mm. but what is lacking is the preciseness and the predictability on how that part of financial market innovation could behave and evolve. You need to create that credibility and, in a way, predictability through regulation so that that capital can be steered and invested as needed in order to have a very consistent build-up of that infrastructure going forward. Do you then actively lobby for more regulation? We are a big fan of regulation, and that might be counterintuitive uh, if you hear it, because ultimately you would say, well, uh, why would it be good to have more rules? But these rules are hopefully perceived as consistent rules over time and give us the stability we seek in financial markets. So this is very contra contradicting to the perception I related to two minutes ago where you know people prior to the fallout did say, well, it is hindering us to really drive innovation as such. But the reality is you need global harmonization and you need to be able to connect the dots to build an infrastructure that uh, in itself creates these or opens these opportunities. And I feel that discussion or this cons consistent dialogue is helping the investment community a lot. Yeah. Well, being a bit of the devil's advocate now, do you believe that there's a current form of regulation that perhaps is unnecessary or that hinders your mission statement? Now, what I would say is that um, regulation doesn't happen overnight. And if you look into how regulation happens and is built, it's a, a function of many different discussions across a variety of different uh, committees and groups. So what's important for us as a market maker, as a member of the market making community, is to constantly provide a fair reflection on how we feel about regulation and what's yet needed. Um, and that's not per se easy because you need to you know, make sure that uh, you're heard and understood and that you are in, in continued alignment with your competitors on this. But that's the piece where I'm quite excited about because if you're able to do that, then you're also helping the political side to it, the regulator, in order to really drive the right decisions. 
and brings me mentally back to the benefits we talked about at the beginning, because we are not driving this innovation in order to make our position as a firm uh, more lucrative. We are driving this because we very much believe that this is a part of financial market changes that uh, are quite relevant for us to consider. Well, a lot of regulation came after the global financial crisis. You worked at Goldman Sachs at the time, which is a very interesting position to be in. Do you believe that the regulation that has been put into place since then could effectively prevent another crash? That's a very, very <laughs> good question to ask. I, I do believe that uh, regulation, even in its most effective form, is uh, not, I would say, effective enough, enough to avoid a crisis because any crisis is, at the heart of it, driven by psychological reactions and expectations. So I think it's more a function of the market participants and even yourself, right? When you then finish your career here at the university and step into the market, that uh, you have a constant learning curve in the back of your mind, that you understand what has happened back then. And if you dissect the financial crisis with hindsight, I still wonder how could it happen? <laughs> right? It's yeah. so obvious to see the different ingredients and how that uh, financial crisis did evolve. But I was part of the financial crisis and uh, was also quite surprised on the dynamic kind of acceleration of the crisis as such. And then it was global and became quite a, quite a significant um, um, challenge for not just financial markets, but for the economies as such. So what I very much believe in is that um, we need to learn from every single crisis and not just uh, get a sense of safety, just based on existing regulation, because regulation, in a way, always needs to adapt, and maybe your perspective on what's in front of you is more, let's say, accurate and more real-time than what any regulation could build around it. Yeah. Well, as of today, the shadow banking system still accounts for 50% of um, the global uh, financial service assets. If regulation can never be enough, are we still too dependent on the shadow banking system's health? I would argue that um, there are many different ways of, uh, of uh, providing liquidity and capital to financial markets, right? And I feel that there is a systemic relevance of the banking industry, no doubt about it, and we need to find the right way and the right environment to create the highest degree of stability. But instability is also not just coming out of the banking system as such, mm. right? There are significant macroeconomic changes. There's also uh, ever-changing different psychological sentiment in markets, right? And, uh, and specifically on that psychological level, if we see new macroeconomic challenges, you have seen it with COVID, there are always new challenges coming to us. And the question is how agile, how resilient are financial markets as such? And then it's not just the banking sector, right? It's the, well, it's the broader community. And I think then the reality is, or the proof point then needs to be, how can we adapt to it? By the way, mentally, this brings me back to liquidity provisioning, mm -hmm. because what we would, would like to stand for, uh, irrespective of any major shift, insecurity, lack of safety, lack of predictability, we stand as a strong partner, you know, with our mission statement to provide the liquidity in order to at least ease the mind of the, of the investors. I think that's a key ingredient of building stability in markets. Yeah. And on the topic of the legislation, say, Theoretically, you were put in a position where you could put down any legislation or reforms you wanted on either trading or the financial markets in general. Is there a specific type of reformation or legislation you have in mind? I would very much come back to the required need to harmonize regulatory landscapes. And I know that this is, uh, in its essence, quite difficult because there are also different mindsets. You take the US versus Europe. But if we really believe in, and I come back to a future version of financial markets, highest degree of interoperability across all the different liquidity pools, that can only unfold in its most optimal form if you have a highly harmonized regulatory landscape across the planet. And maybe that's even pushing it a bit too much, but at least in the, in the most relevant markets of the fi financial community, I think we should steer into you know, increasing the intensity of dialogues across the different regulatory settings globally in order to find that path into further harmonizing it. 
Okay, I believe this. Uh, we have time for one more audience question uh, right here in the front. Thank you for coming today. Uh, so uh, I'm Mateusz and uh, my background is in finance. I want to ask you about your firm and the uh, long-term strategy of it. So uh, as a market firm, you're a market making firm, you are succeeding in this field. But, but as we know, uh, also there are many multi-manager hedge funds that are succeeding uh, in current uh, macroeconomic environment. Do you have any plans to also expand in this field? For example, uh, do, this, do the similar expansion as CITAL did as they were a, a hedge fund, but they expanded and uh, they are also CITAL Securities, which is a market making firm. And do you plan to have similar objectives with your firm to I don't know, d divide it, separate those entities in order to have uh, two firms also as a hedge fund mm -hmm. uh, that invest in yeah, broad class of uh, assets? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, in terms of our core business, which is the liquidity provisioning across all the different asset classes and regions, we are quite excited about the opportunities that are yet given to us. So at this point in time, we really feel strongly about further driving our core. And, uh, we did talk about crypto, so that's a, a key part of our strategy, but also we are looking into a further expansion in fixed income, for instance, and, and commodities. So given that, there is also a, a clear realization on our side that we do not want to create any inherent areas of conflict. So being a neutral market maker and liquidity provider is a different stance than being also an investor, a hedge fund, and, uh, and seeking alpha capture strategies around the market making. So for us, it's very clean and lean. And uh, I sense that also the community as such requires the best in class market maker with that neutral stance. So given our strategy for the next few years, that we would like, uh, there we would like to lean in. Having said that, we have uh, built a venture fund two years ago because we do sense that driving financial market innovation is not just a function of providing liquidity, but also taking equity investments in related infrastructure opportunities. That could be an investment in a new trading platform, that could be an investment in a, a, a technology company that's really help um, disseminating data, for instance. So a lot comes together at the intersection between the day-to-day -day liquidity provisioning and then more strategic investments in players across the broader ecosystem that help us and help the community in order to drive uh, investment opportunities. So, so that is uh, an add-on, but uh, we stick to uh, at the heart of it to our core. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, and now as we start to wrap up and come to the end of the interview, I think it's good to zoom out and consider the rapid technological development in your field. Do you think it's time that we kind of conceptually rethink what trading and financial markets do, or it should go on the current path it's on? No, I very much feel that there's an opportunity eh, to be excited about how trading and financial market innovation as such will evolve. Also, trading has changed dramatically, right? We did talk about the algorithmic side to it uh, opened up as an opportunity through the availability of more and more data. There are different curves we, uh, you have certainly seen on how fast technological innovation is accelerating and the, just the sheer computing power available on the planet, not yet tapping into quant computing, but that curve is clearly exponential and uh, you can make a good estimate where in five or ten years the global community will stand on that. I also believe that markets as such, we haven't touched much about uh, electronification, but trading changes from voice, right, in the past, specifically on the fixed income side, into being end-to-end -end electronified. And the reality is there is a strong correlation between electronification and trading volumes. So as more data becomes available and as more trades become fully electronified, there is a significant opportunity to also drive more volumes across the financial investment community. 
that's a tremendous opportunity because it creates more opportunities for investors to seek opportunities and get the best prices in place. So I'm quite excited about that. I'm also excited about the fact that the community is very much connected. So that innovation is not happening in isolation in the back pocket of the market, but it's very transparent how the different parts of the equation, the buy side, the sales side, the technologist firms and the market making community all has to collaborate going forward in order to make that a reality. So, yeah. And how do you ensure that Flow Traders always stays at the forefront of that change? So it starts with you. <laughs> uh, it's uh, seeking the best talent. Um, so it's a big privilege for me to be here with you today. Hopefully also exciting you about uh, not just our mission statement, but also how the firm is part of a much bigger happening and uh, also responsibility, I would even say. Um, so it really starts and ends with finding the best talent and retaining the best talent. At the same time, it's also very much about the climate we would like to set in our company. So our company was founded 20 years ago. It still feels as a very, very yeah, innovation-oriented, entrepreneurial company, which we also feel is needed. So always starting the next day with the question, what can we do better? Where do we need to improve? And in a way, sometimes I feel it's a bit like uh, whitewater rafting. So we are operating in a very volatile environment maybe not volatile, but ever-changing, fast-changing, and uh, there are always surprises, good and bad surprises. So this creates a, a very specific mindset, which I feel, you know, as someone stepping out of university trying to find the first job, it's a tremendous opportunity because you're getting into a learning opportunity that puts you into a different stage so that you're not, uh, you know, getting into this wrong perception of I can predict the future and out of that I know what to do. In our situation, everything is changing every single day, but still having a very strategic path at the company and then on a very individual level, career tracks that equip you with the best capabilities and the best knowledge in order to thrive in that environment, that's great. And my personal perception, irrespective of flow traders, I think the world has changed. So, and I think we all need to embrace the fact that one thing is for certain, and that's constant change. And maybe it's fair to say with not just the globalized version of this world, but also the way how technology plays into it, the availability of information and data, that change will further accelerate for the next 10 plus years to come, and maybe won't stop. So getting then you individually into this mindset of, I can relate to that, it's not challenging me, it's not scaring me, Actually, I see that this is creating a significant amount of opportunities. That's how I feel about the culture within flow traders. Yeah. Because that mindset is part of our DNA and equips us well to get ready for our future. Well, I think this brings us to an end. I would like to thank you, Mike, very much for coming here and sharing such valuable insights. I'd also like to thank the audience for being here. Uh, for those of you that enjoyed this interview, we also have another interview with the founder of Moscow Times. Uh, a massive English, uh, English newspaper founded in Russia, but had to move to Amsterdam. And we'll be talking about that trip and the development of the newspaper itself with its founder, Dirk Sauer. So Monday here at the same time, one to two. Looking forward to seeing you guys there. Thank you so much for Thank being you here. So much.